Hey, you're joining us at Outlaw Welding Worldwide, and we're on the couch today. I'm Ashley Applegate with Kentucky Welding Institute, and we're going to talk everything fabrication, and who knows where this is going to lead. So I'm going to let my guests introduce themselves today. I'm joined with Blake Hawkins. I'm here with the Kentucky Welding Institute as well. Yeah, I'm Marshall Whitney. I'm the owner of Rom Industries out here in Houston. Marshall, tell us a little bit about what you guys do over there. Well, we're kind of a mix between a, a small production shop and just a job shop. So we do a little bit of both all at the same time. Uh, we run a lot of repeat work that we've been doing since October in the Bitcoin mining industry. And, uh, and then we also will just pull on, you know, we'll build five skids here or do this there and, and a little bit of everything. Okay. Cool. You know, I, I've got a, a extensive background in, in fabrication, you know, so I think we got a, a lot of different things in common. You know, if someone was looking to come to work for you, what do you look for? Well, uh, uh, as, as guys that are familiar with welding schools, we do now mainly hire out of welding schools because the, as everyone knows in America right now, there is a labor shortage and the best place for me to get welders especially in our production side where the tasks are repetitive and they're quicker to learn and all that. Um, I actually take my leads from the instructors. So I'd say if you're a new student looking for work, you need to make sure that you are talking and dealing with your instructors, that you are showing effort and that they do like you because they will recommend you to guys like me. And generally I got first pick, I, I've got these kids jobs before they're graduated and they're working for me part-time, and then we just roll them into full-time where they start. So I'm looking for the best. I'm looking for the guys that don't have a loud mouth because I don't want a bad attitude coming into my shop, you know. Uh, I'm looking for guys that are putting out effort and, and are multifaceted. So in a shop like ours, one day you may be running a dual shield, the next day you're running hard wire. You might be tacking up or welding something with TIG. It might even be brass, something you've never even touched before in your life. And I'm looking for a guy that can just sit down, knows knows the machines, knows their settings, and can just weld. Yeah. And then when we're slow, guess what? You're sweeping, you're cleaning, yeah. you're doing all these things. You're not going to the truck and just checking out. You know, where. So that's what we look for. Yeah, that's right. Blake, what do you think on the fabrication side of the house? One thing he was saying there that really, uh, I guess, hits hits the home there. I've had several <clears throat> people I've worked for in the past. They'll hit me up, <clears throat> wanting to know if I wanted to go back out to work. And, of course, I'm still teaching at the time, and I'll I'll actually refer students, I guess, like the same that you're doing. And I'm only going to refer the students that I know that are going to make a good name for me because uh, I still want to keep that contact. Uh, so, for sure, I'm only going to send the students that I know are hard workers, good welders, uh, and they'll do anything you ask them to do in a heartbeat. Uh, and then uh, there's been times, uh, of course, our instructors, they go in and off on the road, and I've taken a few students with me before. I need a well partner, uh, yeah. so I'm only going to take the one that I know is right. going to be able to right. pack the same weight that I am. Yeah, right. yeah. So, you know, I ran and started my business in '96, and you know, it, it, it's wild. You talk about people trying to get jobs, and and I remember one situation where I had a young man working for me, and he'd been there quite a while, and and, and he, he said, "I'm going to have to put him a two weeks' notice." He said, "I found a job," and he said, "I can move up and go places." and you know, I'm not going to throw that guy under the bus. I want what's best for everybody. Right. Uh, so I shook his hand. I appreciated the, the two-week notice. And, and I said, oh, I'm going to have to look for somebody else now because you're going to be hard to replace. And, and lo and behold, before that evening was over, a gentleman walked in the door. And uh, he said, hey, my name's RT. And I knew, I knew this gentleman. He goes, uh, I'm looking for a spot. And the other guy's name was Tyler. And Tyler looked at him and said, you know what? I just quit. You know, of course, he didn't just quit. He had a two-week notice, but it was... I don't know, the, the higher power looking out for, for all of us. Right. Uh, a guy found a better spot, I needed a, a welder, and RT needed a job. And, and those three things just hit. All right. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and we, I run a, a big chunk of our welders are, are through weld staffing. So we supply labor to other shops, to, to some refinery work, turnaround, wherever it is we're doing. And, and there's two things about that. One is, uh, I'd say, if you're looking to quit, you're looking. You got two dollars more an hour, five dollars more an hour somewhere else, so the per diem's better on another job. You're transitioning from fab shop. You've got your skills under you now, and you want to go out in the field and make that big money. 
cool, man. I'll suggest to you have a talk with that employer. As an employer, I say, man, and I know this is a double-sided story. You say, well, if you could have paid me more, you should have paid, been paying me more. But sometimes just ask. Maybe yeah. I can pay you more because you are that good hand, that guy that I need, the guy I was looking to step up and maybe be the shop manager or the shift manager or whatever it is. Just just have that conversation. But on the other hand, as Sam, you said, I'm not here holding him back. I tell my guys all the time, you will make me more money if you become a successful fabricator and have your own business and you need some parts laser cut or press work where you hire me. Then I'm making money off you. I'm here to teach you and help you grow and, and recognize that and recognize that and, and learn and do it and take off and do your own thing. Yeah. You know, there's a big difference too in, in a welder and a fabricator. Absolutely. A welder can run a bead and, and a fabricator can, mm -hmm. can visualize it, they can see it. And then they can make it become a, a three-dimensional whatever it is, whether it's a truck bed or whether it's a multi-million dollar project. Fabricators can do that. Absolutely, man. I, I see a lot of welders that can't really read prints, let alone a tape measure. Um, one of the things about working in a fab shop that is maybe hard for a school to even reproduce, I, I'm not familiar with y'all's canvas, but you know, we've got four, five, six, seven different kinds of saws in our shop, from band saws, horizontal, vertical, We've got fully automated cold saws. We've got dry cut saws. We've got all these things that, that these young men and women are thrust into our shop and they don't know how to use it. So right. I encourage you, talk to your instructors. You guys have been around, you travel around, you own the fab shop. Y'all know all these tools. These young people got to learn and talk and learn and grow. Watch YouTube, what you're doing right now and, and learn about this stuff. That will greatly help you. Even if you, I'll say, go get the horizontal bandsaw and you go over there and pick up a little DeWalt uh, portable, I'm, I'm uh, not being thrilled about that, you know. Right. Yeah, there, there's so many different things and tools and, and projects that you can learn. And You know, I, I appreciate a, an individual, whether it's a foreman in, in the pipe rack or someone else, that if, if you've got the, the, the want to, well, they'll show you a thing or two. And I think that means a, a lot because, you know, in America today, it, it seems like we have more and more people going to college, right. and then they get out of college and there isn't a job available for that particular degree. Right. But you can go to a, a trade school or, or welding school like we are, and when you get out, there's there's a job available even in today's economy. Absolutely. I'll tell you, I've got my last set of hires, let's just say the summer of this year, 2022, the good majority of them are in their mid-30s. They did go to college or they did whatever. They're fed up with it. They want to be welders. They want to work with their hands. They want to do whatever. I've got people that were chefs, uh, all kinds of from previous industries. In fact, I'm hiring a guy on Wednesday and next week, he's got a good job at the airport doing maintenance or whatever, benefits, all these things. So bro, you need to think long and hard. And he said, I want to be a welder. I want to change my life. And I, I could not talk him out of doing work for me. And, and he started Wednesday. So well, I do see a shift of people realizing, and I'm a college guy, uh, I did that. and. And I'm not an advocate for it anymore. I'm kind of in that micro world where maybe yeah. it's not the best idea anymore. You know, you can change your life well, you can change your life being a woodworker, whatever it is you want to do. Well, Blake, you primarily went the, the piping route and, and chased the paper across America, but but when when that job slows down and you're still with that company, they they're going to ask you to fab some stuff, right? Oh yeah, most definitely. I mean, you'll be finishing up the job, and even if they don't ask you to fab anything or put something back together, they're going to ask you to clean something out or just to keep you busy to keep you on the payroll and no matter what I'm going to be doing I'm still going to be making well or pay for sure yeah now the, the turn in the economy it seems like we're we're always ups or downs and, and maybe at, at, at this time people are, are leaning toward a you know a downward turn what's your what's your take on that well man I'll tell you uh, in in um, June we saw a slowdown in a number of our bids and what I tell our guys is my job is I'm looking six months out. So I, a bid coming in on a million dollars of skids or whatever, that doesn't, you don't just turn that around like that. There's so much back and forth. So, so we have an early indicator of what the economy is in June. It dried up. There was nothing. And that, I think, was panic because everyone was talking recession, recession, recession. But I'll tell you right now, probably during this interview, I bet I got four more requests for stuff to be built. Um, so it's, it's turned around. People are realizing it wasn't maybe that big of a deal for right now. Uh, and the cool thing about being a welder, a fabricator, or whatever, is when the economy's hot, early this year, 
this is our Bitcoin mining job. Bitcoin was a ridiculous amounts of money. I don't know. I don't own one. I said, I'm a welder. We'll, we'll do our welding stuff. We got the serial job and we've, we've been producing containers since uh, December. Well, now Bitcoins are not hardly worth near as much. But guess what is coming back up? Repair work, fixing things. As people are getting tight on their money, they need to not buy a new lawnmower even. They need, to, they need you to weld the deck of this one out. So there's plenty of opportunity if you're good with your hands and you know what to do. Yeah, that's right. I've done a lot of work for, you know, the, the steel industry for, you know, the eastern part of the United States. Uh, and then if we would be in between contracts or jobs, then, yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to pick up a repair, build a truck bed, whatever it takes to, to keep the employees working and, and keep the shop going. Um, for a welder with skill, I, I don't think there's a... A lot of recession. A lot. Uh, there's, there's way too much work out there for a welder for you not to have a job. Yeah, and you know, there's a, I get a lot of welders. Well, I'm not working for that little pay or whatever. And I say, I say to you, don't look at your life in this little window. Look at it overall. Go work those two days on that job. Guys like me, I'll hire you for two days, and and you'll get your money and do whatever. But don't set yourself back. Don't miss out on that five hundred dollars or whatever it is. Keep keep plugging along, man. Just because you're snobbish about what you will and won't weld you know? and i don't know if it's just the welder mentality or something but i mean you'll go out and you'll work a job making 40 dollars an hour and then the next job offer is 32 you're going to tell yourself well i ain't going to take nothing less than 40 now those jobs they come and go you just need to take what's there kwi is pumping out students every every yeah, few right. weeks somebody will take that 32 yeah. dollar an hour job yeah, we graduate students every two weeks. We start every two weeks, so, so it's kind of unique. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, most of our students come for our pipe program because we're primarily a, a pipe school, as you know. Um, but with all the AWS certifications, uh, those students get starting out with flux core and stick weld, which is wire feed on the flux core end and then MIG. They can jump into a shop, a job right. shop or a fab shop, and then you you top that off with with you know, rigging certifications, and a lot of shops have overhead cranes and, and OSHA training. You hire an employee, and that's what a lot of people want. So I think you get a, a, a good, versatile welder. They can do what Blake said. They can, not this job's not here today, but this job is available there today. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I love seeing guys that know how to rig, know what a come along is, let alone <laughs> how to use it. You know, know, know how, to, how to tighten the shackle know how to do all these just things that we take for granted know how to use some ratchet straps on a trailer you would not believe I, i've probably spent ten thousand dollars paying people to roll up the ends of ratchet straps and redo them you know there's just just learn that kind of stuff it's yeah. easy it's easy it's easy to be better than your peers if you just take these basics yeah i think you kind of hit on it there pride in your work you know you are your first call it QC or first inspector or whatever the word may be, but, but it's pride in your work, you know, and, um, you know, fixing your lunch. Do you, do you want to take pride in that sandwich? You just throw all the crap in there and shake the, shake the baggie up. It's going to not, not be a good sandwich. Yeah. But when you take pride in your work, grinding, welding, cleaning up after yourself, all those things. Absolutely. Go a long way. Absolutely. I don't know how it is on the pipeline. I don't, we don't do much or any of that. I never have. I've been always on the refinery side and, upstream down or sorry downstream and uh uh it taking that pride is is a big deal because we've also had problems with a lot of welders that don't want to grind they don't want to do whatever they're here they come here they come weld they'll do these rollouts and they don't want to do anything else they don't even want to wire wheel them when they're done and that's such a little thing like you're gonna you're gonna choose that hill to die on right there let's you're in this shop you got a fan on you you're making 30 bucks an hour or whatever it is Run that wire wheel, man. It's not that big of a deal. Yes, yeah. just do it. You know, the, today there's a lot of job shops that have, have bid work, and, and they may be, have bid that work six months ago, and now the job's coming. Uh, but what's your input cost now? It's, you know, triple in some yeah. cases with, with yeah. steel and gas prices. Um, and now everybody wants to hire wage. Well, you got to look at, at the owners of those companies right. when you're going in. They bid a job at... at this amount of price and this amount of wage, yeah, they still got to keep the lights on and keep everybody a job. But I would rather, you know, go to work every day and have a paycheck is, is be sitting on the couch making zero. Right. You're right. And, and that, that's to the point I said I'm bidding six months out. And, 
and bids we're doing now, yeah, we're smart enough, I learned enough that we're adding in clauses to escalate wages and material right. and all that. But no one in February saw that steel was going to be up another 20, 30 percent. Well, we, we didn't see that coming. And, and you got to work with me, man. Like, we can't do these jobs in the negative. We just can't do that. So we got to help everybody. You said uh, earlier today, I was listening, we're a family. And yeah, sometimes we, we all got to take that, that bite of that of that sandwich that doesn't taste very good and, and come together and well. Yeah, it, it comes all the way down the line. You know, people can complain about high gas prices and, and, and I don't like to pay that price at the pump and com people can complain about high grocery prices and I don't like to pay those, you know, food bills either. But when you have those input costs all the way down at the manufacturer, it costs more to build that tractor that's going to harvest that crop. You know, it costs more to pay that employee that put together that, that piece of equipment or that truck or that rail car that hauled that commodity. Uh, it costs more to pay that truck driver to, to get that commodity. So it, we're all linked together in, in the price and the supply and demand. It starts a lot of times with the fab shop guy. Absolutely. What's cool about that and it's cool about it, I know in Houston, is um, we're starting to see a shift in, in companies that come to me, my little shop, for work. We're bidding on stuff for Mahindra right now. Mahindra is a global company, right. and you know their stuff comes from India or wherever it is. But now they need a guy in Houston to make and fabricate parts for them because the supply chain is screwed up. It's too expensive to ship this tractor part to wherever. So I think that we, we hopefully, hope to God, we will see these small um, local community-based fab shops produce parts for even big companies all over America again, like maybe we used to. That's another good sign for welders. You know, let's. Let's figure out how to do that and bring this kind of stuff back because they're great, easy, good money jobs. Go home to your wife and kids and right. it's, it's payday. Yeah, there's the little job shop is, is all over America. And and sometimes it is a, a welder like Blake who who's off the road for two weeks and, and their neighbor wants him to do something and that turns into, you know, the, the next day. Yep. Yeah. So... Uh, Anything else, fabrication-wise, economy-wise, anything else you're thinking? No, I think uh, just keep on trucking on like we've been trucking on and work hard and, uh, you know, we'll do what we do. Y'all keep producing students and I'll keep trying to chase down work. And, yeah. Good. Blake, uh, uh, of course, you worked at a fab shop before. One, one piece of advice for a student who, who wants to get into the industry, and, you know, as a, as a younger guy, what, what's your one piece of advice you want to get? I guess something like that, I would say, is to be like a sponge. Soak up every piece of knowledge that you can, uh, yep. and hold on to it and learn from it. Uh, be be willing to learn and uh, be willing to take that advice uh, from your peers because uh, that's where you're going to learn the most. Yep. Well, you've been watching Outlaw Welding Worldwide with Marshall Blake. I'm Ashley Applegate. Stay tuned to next time.